Hi there, welcome to Houston Baptist University Psych 5310 Ethical and Professional Issues in Psychology and Counseling. We are now on Module 6 and covering Chapters 10 and 11. So Chapter 10 covers theory and practice. What is your counseling theory? It's important for you to know your theoretical foundational beliefs as they will help you and guide you as you work with clients. When you uh, hit those quiet moments and you don't know what else to ask or what else to say with clients, um, falling back on your foundational beliefs. How does change happen? And these are the things that will help you and guide you as you work with clients. Who has the responsibility in therapy? Sometimes therapists become so deeply involved and so frustrated because the clients don't seem to be making the progress that you had hoped. Well, who has the responsibility? Who establishes the goals of the counseling? How and why do you select the techniques that you use with each client? What about assessment and diagnosis? How do you make the assessments? What tools, instruments will you use? And what factors weigh into your decisions regarding assessment and diagnosis? These are important things to consider. You also need to be very culturally sensitive. You have to always consider what cultural issues um, with, we're considering your assessments, your diagnoses, um, how has the cultural influence um, actually changed people and um, struggling here? Stop. Hi there. Welcome to Houston Baptist University Psych 5310 Ethical and Professional Issues in Psychology and Counseling. Welcome to Module 6. We're covering chapters 10 and 11. In Chapter 10, there's the important questions about theory and putting things into practice. So what is your counseling theory? It's important for you to know. You need to know your theoretical foundational beliefs, as they will help you and guide you as you're working with clients. How do you think change happens? Which of the theories are you most comfortable using? This will guide you when you hit the... Um, kind of hit some brick walls every once in a while and you're not sure how to proceed. Going back to your foundational beliefs about how change happens in people's lives will be very helpful. So who has the responsibility in therapy? Um, when things are not progressing as quickly as you might like, who's responsible for that? Who establishes the goals of counseling? Is it the therapist or the client? How and why do you select the techniques that you use? How about the assessments and your diagnosis? How do you use assessment and diagnosis in your practice? And what factors weigh into your decisions regarding assessment and diagnosis? These are important things to consider. Cultural sensitivity is also very important. Practitioners must consider the cultural issues in assessment and diagnosis. There might be instruments that you cannot use because they're not culturally sensitive. Um, you need to know your ethical codes. And you also need to consider how the DSM system might pathologize clients. Uh, and they might take a diagnosis and think, I have this pathology and there's no hope. Okay? And this might, in, in the end, in the long run, perpetuate the actual oppression of clients from diverse groups. So being very cultural sensitive in your assessments and your diagnoses is very important. In chapter 11, we cover couples and family therapy. Um, you need to understand systems theory. Um, systems theory views psychological and relational problems as arising from within the individual's present environment and intergenerational family systems. Any actions by one individual member influence all of the other members in the system, and their reactions then have a reciprocal effect on the individual. So. No person, no client lives on an island or a vacuum. They interact with others all the time, and as they're trying to make change, others around them may be hindering their change. So a problem that a client has might be a symptom of how the, sim the system functions, not actually a symptom of the individual's maladjustment or psychosocial development. So this is just something to consider carefully as you work with clients. Ethical standards when working with couples and families. Um, whose interests should the family therapist serve? Uh, 
what limits of confidentiality should be considered. If you're working with a couple, can you meet with them individually? Or would, they, would that um, break your ethical codes of confidentiality? What about competence and integrity? The, these requirements are still in place. You still have to be competent, but how do you become competent? You still must have integrity. How do you do that? What responsibilities are different when you're dealing with couples or families as opposed to an individual? Informed consent is still necessary with couples and families, even more so, perhaps. It's more complex. The family is the focus of this approach, not just one person. Um, are you going to see any of the family members individually? Will you require all family members to attend? What if one person in the family chooses not to attend? Does that mean no one can have the family counseling? These are considerations that come up when you're working with couples and families. Values. Non-traditional families may be harder for you to understand or work with, but you need to become more comfortable with that. What values and experiences of yours are likely to influence how you would work with couples and families? You need to consider gender sensitivity. Always remember that imposing your own values on your clients can do considerable harm, so this must be avoided at all costs. And what responsibility do we have when we become aware of intimate partner violence? What do you have to do? There is so much more, as always, in these chapters, so please, please, please read the chapters very carefully, and I will see you next week. Bye. <music>